We are again first with a presentation from Morris Gleason, rock star genealogist, mm -hmm. superstar genealogist, author of a couple of blogs, uh, has an amazing YouTube channel, and he does really great things with autosomal DNA, but we brought him over for his Y expertise. We've got a lot of people who've requested on how to group people, because we have a lot of, of people that, that, you know, it's been a long time since we've talked about that kind of thing. So, without further ado, we have Morris tell you how to group folks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks again to Max and Bennett and the entire Family Jubilee team for a wonderful conference and for inviting me here to speak. And this is being recorded as we speak. It is going to go up on my YouTube channel, which is simply DNA and Family Tree Research. So just Google YouTube DNA and Family Tree Research, you will find it there. And today I'm going to talk to you about markers of potential relatedness. And this was a concept that I developed uh, when I inadvertently inherited the Carroll DNA project. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about that. But this is a way of uh, grouping your project members as accurately as you possibly can. Because the, uh, if, you, if they're not grouped accurately, then your interpretation of the data is going to be faulty. So it's very important to group your project members accurately. But taking a big step back, why would you do a surname study in the first place? Um, and, and I emphasize the fact an inherited surname study because some places don't have inherited surnames. They have patronymic surnames like Iceland, uh, Thailand as well, and there's various other places. And inherited surnames came late to several places, but in Ireland and in England, they go back roughly about a thousand years, slightly less than that in England. Um, but you could ask questions like, where did the surname come from? Where did it originate? Are there different origins for the surname? Is the surname associated with one or more genetic signatures? And then when did the surname arise? How old is each of the genetic groups in your project? How did the surname evolve over time? How are different variants related to each other? And which members are most closely related to each other? These are the kind of questions that you could ask in relation to a surname project. And in that in mind, why do we group people together? Because men with the same surname and a similar genetic signature are likely to have arisen from the same common ancestor, the founder of that surname. So that's my conceptualization of surname research, surname projects, and that's what I do in my projects. I'm trying to take them back to the founder of the surname. So, wouldn't it be great if your project members were grouped automatically? I mean, how, how many people would think that that would be a, a great thing? Okay. Now, uh, put your hands up if you know that this already exists. One, two, three, four. It's, it's already here. This does happen automatically with World Families Net, run by Terry Barton, Marilyn Barton, and a part-time program. And um, in particular, the project administration pages takes you to the results tool guide. And if you look at the results tool guide, and there's a whole page of explanation about what it actually does, um, it compares each member against the ancestral, uh, the apparent ancestral profile, which is um, the same as the group modal haplotype. Um, it's the modal value to find if, if the value is present on a particular marker in more than 75% of the men present. And the grouping criteria are exactly the same as family tree DNA. Um, a definite uh, relationship would be maybe uh, less than or equal to 2 out of 25, 4 out of 27, 7 out of 67, and around about 10 or 11 out of 111. And then they also identify possible um, group members by just a slightly more relaxed uh, threshold for genetic distance. The trouble with this, of course, is that extreme outliers will be missed and they will be ungrouped. And that is a common feature of whatever um, a system of genetic distance matching you use. And I'll show you uh, what happens with Chase Ashley's tool as well. But the great thing about Terry Barton's World Families Net a results tool is that it automatically updates every night. And new members are then highlighted the next morning in green, new results are highlighted in yellow, 
it handles up to 400 people per project. This was only about 70 people per project in 2015, but this has gone up to 400 people per project now. Um, members can also manually either group people or ungroup people following the automatic update. And uh, the only caveat is that convergence will not be detected. So that if there are chance matches due to convergence, they will appear in that group automatically. You will have to weed them out manually, but before you do that, you have to identify them. And that's one of the things we'll be talking about today. So this is a wonderful tool that Terry and his team have put together over the years. Um, other benefits that I like all, all regarding worldfamilies.net is that you get a separate web page for members' pedigrees. You don't have that on the Family Tree DNA interface, so what I tend to do is I take the news uh, tab and I convert that into a pedigrees tab and put my pedigrees for my project members there. The other thing is the pretty colors, uh, like this, which, like I said yesterday when we were talking about mutation history trees, are very important because they help you identify the unique STR pattern for the group. And you can see the unique pattern here. There's a, a virtually a continuous blue line, two blue lines there that are blue and two oranges. Another blue one here, another blue one here, and um, then you have another orange one here. And this is the unique STR pattern for uh, Gleason Lineage 2. And it becomes very important when you start looking at markers of potential relatedness. We'll be using that later on. So uh, Terry's team just consists of Terry, uh, his wife Marilyn, part-time programmer. Uh, Terry manages hundreds of projects, so I'm making a, an appeal. Please pick a project and volunteer to help me. Because there are a lot of orphan projects associated, um, well, we have 9,400 surname projects, a lot of them are orphaned because the project administrators have lost interest or passed away. These are the first few. This is the complete list of the larger ones. Now have a look at that list and just see if any of your ancestral surnames appear on that list. Because Terry is looking for people to help him uh, work on some of these projects. And um, I mentioned my Farrell project. I, one of my great-great-great-grandmothers was Catherine Farrell. I thought, oh, maybe I, I take an interest in the project, maybe I can be a co-admin. I wrote to the chap and he said, I've had eight strokes in the last year, can you please take the whole thing over? So I inherited a project with 170 members. That's where I did my learning. That's where I learned about grouping. That's where all of these concepts about markers of potential relatedness came from. So my message to you, especially the newbies, the new project administrators in the audience take on one of the larger projects because that is how you will learn your craft. Now, how many people in the audience see an ancestral surname among that list? Quite a few. How many of you would be interested in taking on one of those surnames and learning your craft that way? One, two, three, okay, four. So please contact Terry. Terry, can you just show your hand? While Terry has got his hand up, please can you give him a, a hand of applause, a round of applause. <laughs> so it's, it's a wonderful um, uh, way of grouping your project. It, it does it automatically. And another tool that recently came out is one from Chase Ashley. It's the YDNA Family Grouping app. And you can do two things here. You can either just simply put in the URL address for your results page in that particular um, box there, or on the other one over here, you can create a CSV file and we can then submit that CSV file. The reason that you would do a CSV file rather than um, the URL is because the, the public results page is only has those publicly viewable um, kits. And a lot of people in your project um, have not made their kits publicly viewable largely because they don't know about the fact that the default position is to keep those kits hidden. So um, if you do a CSV file, you actually uh, avoid that particular issue. But if you do put in the, the web address of the public results page, uh, then you'll get, oh, and he's also thinking of developing a cladogram. So uh, you may very well be able to put in the web address or a CSV file, press the button, and not only do you get your, your project members grouped, but you also have them in a 
nice tree, a descendancy tree, a mutation history tree, just like we were talking about yesterday. <coughs> and if you, um, he uses a slightly different grouping process to worldfamilies.net. Um, they initially group kids in accordance with family tree DNA criteria, um, but they only have members in a group that are less than four out of 37 to each other, or less than seven out of 67, or less than 10 out of 111. So it's a very, very tight group. Then what they do, is, so no one within the group has a genetic distance from every other member in that group higher than four out of 37. So a very, very um, tight group. Then what they do is they merge overlapping groups because one member in one group may be a distance of four out of 37 to a member in another group, in which case those two groups are merged. So they start merging those groups together, and then you get more of a genetic distance spread within this larger group. And it does exceed that uh, genetic distance of four out of 37. I'll show you some data on that. Um, most kids will be less than or equal to four from the modal, but not necessarily from the from everybody else within the group. But from the modal haplotype of the group, they will be usually a genetic distance of less than or equal to four. The maximum genetic distance between group members, though, can get very high, and I'm going to show you an example of that. So this is the output you get when you put the URL in, and uh, this is Mike Leeson's lineage two, and he's grouped them, and he's put them in a group called number two here. But there's several interesting things Firstly, this member here is group three, this member here is group four, and this member here has no group assignment. So these are my Gleason lineage two members, and most of them fit into his group number two, but there's one person in a group called number three, one person in a group called number four, and one person hasn't been assigned. So what's going on there? Let's take a closer look. And in order to do that, I have um, created a CSV file. This is the uh, results page uh, in, your, in, in my GAP pages. So as an administrator, you'll be able to go in here. And there is a button that says export to spreadsheet. And that is how you create your CSV file to put into the app. So I created my CSV file. It downloads it as an XML file. If you try to open that, it opens it up in the browser, and it's really confusing. So what you do is you upload, you, upload, um, you uh, start Excel, and then you open it within Excel, and then you save as a CSV file. If you Google it, you'll get instructions, I'm sure. But that's how you actually get around um, converting from an XML file to a CSV file. And this is a slide I showed yesterday. These are my Gleason Lineage 2s. So you don't need to worry about the detail. But um, what I'm going to show you here is that um, we have the, very, the 11 branches in Gleason Lineage 2, 37 members, 32 members of this group were on the tree. This has been confirmed by 10 big Y tests and 10 SNP pack tests. Everybody in this group shares uh, A5631, which is the overarching SNP for Gleason Lineage 2. Now let's look and see what happened with uh, Chase Ashley's grouping app. Branch F, which is an outlier branch, was identified as group two. Everybody else was identified as group three. And then when you look at the genetic distance of group uh, two, the minimum genetic distance of anybody in group two to group three is seven out of 37. They really are a branch outlying away from everybody else but they're still connected to the rest of the group by this overarching SNP A5631, which is dated to about a thousand years ago. So it's just at the start of that surname era. But it's very interesting that the, when you're just looking at genetic distance alone, using the standard family tree DNA defined uh, thresholds, you are actually getting separation of an outlying group from the main group. Um, also, there was another outlier identified here. Um, his minimum genetic distance to anybody else in group three was five out of 37, below the threshold, therefore not grouped. There was another outlier here, minimum genetic distance, seven out of 37 to everybody else in the group, but still sharing those SNPs that we talked about. 
And there's also group five, um, which was a new group that was formed, minimum genetic distance seven out of 37. I think there were two people in that particular group. There was also group four, again, two or three people, but they had not yet been placed on the tree and the minimum genetic distance to anybody else in the group was five out of 37. And then there was another outlier, again, a minimum genetic distance of five out of 37 to anybody else. So this is now, you're seeing where the outliers are. You know, because I've done my mutation history tree and I've done my SNP testing, I can actually identify that person as an outlier. I mean, normally, he'd just be in the on group section. I wouldn't even think twice about it. But because I've done pretty advanced SNP testing on group two, I can identify where these outliers are. So three outliers were missed completely. That's 8% failed to be grouped using this uh, genetic distance uh, uh, algorithm. And then in group two, there were five people, and then there were two, two others in separate groups. So altogether, about 19% of my lineage two members were not grouped by this particular app. And it just serves to point out that it's great for those that are relatively close to the modal haplotype, but for those that are outliers, it fails to include them in the group because it thinks they are too far away. The other thing it did was it put four unrelated traces into group three, and that's where they, those are their closest matches within, within um, at least in lineage two. And these are uh, people that are connected to the leases by a common ancestor that was 1,500 to 2,000 years ago. So these are uh, matches that are due to convergence, but the program doesn't recognize them as convergent matches and chance matches. It puts them into my lineage too, where they should not actually be. So these are some of the limitations of this particular group. But if we actually look at the genetic distance of each kit, uh, from the genetic two modal in group two, so there's group two, there's five people in group two, uh, their genetic distance of each um, member uh, from the modal of this group, uh, one is an exact match to the modal, one is a distance of two out of 37, one is three out of 37, three, four out of 37, you know, not too, not too much spread, all within that matching threshold. The maximum genetic distance between any of these five members goes up to 7 out of 37. Watch what happens when we do the same exercise, comparing the members of group 2 with those in group 3. The maximum genetic distance goes up to 13 out of 37. This is a group that has been defined by SNP testing, and the maximum genetic distance between one outlier on one end of the group and another outlier on the other end of the group is 13 out of 37. And if you saw that in a new member, you would never think to actually include them in the group. But everybody shares the SNP A5631 dated about a thousand years ago. So it's a great exercise. When we look at group three, the genetic distance of each kid from the group three modal haplotype, some of them are two out of 37, quite a few are three, quite a few are four. Now we're seeing some fives and there's even two sixes from the modal haplotype for just group three here. When we look at the maximum genetic distance between any two members in group three, it's going up to 10 out of 37. And of course, if you compare group three and group two, it goes up to 13 out of 37. So this is a wonderful way of actually seeing the degree of spread in genetic distance from the modal haplotype within your group. But the limitations of the tool, it's obviously grouping about 80%, 90% of the people correctly, but the extreme outliers are being missed, and convergence is still a problem because we're getting those traces put in and they shouldn't be there. And these, this convergence is uh, results in chance matches being grouped by mistake due to SCR signatures that are similar by chance. This is where the markers of potential relatedness come to the rescue, and specifically three of them matches terminal SNP analysis, rare marker values, and the unique SCR pattern. So those are the ones that I want to focus on for the rest of the, of the talk. Now, we have talked about convergence, and here is a diagrammatic explanation of what divergence could, is, is actually means. 
So if you start off with an SDR marker, and this is just a single SDR marker, and let's say 10,000 years ago, the value of this particular marker was eight, and it was held by Frank. And Frank had uh, several children, one, two, three, four, uh, Bob, Dick, uh, Tom, and Peter, and they had descendants, and over the course of the millennia, you see that that marker value, just that single marker value, mutated up, and then up again, and then stayed the same, then up again, and then up again, up again, up again, then down, and that's in one of the lines. And um, if you look, this, the, the first one would be divergent. So you're seeing, you're getting divergence away from the original value. Um, you're getting a lack, relative lack of divergence here. It kind of diverges from uh, 7,000 years ago, and then it stays the same. So it's a relative lack of divergence. Um, but then you're also getting convergence. So for example, the green line was diverging initially, and then it started converging until it is now the same value as the blue line. Now, they have a common ancestor 10,000 years ago, but because they're an exact match in the present day, it looks like they probably share an ancestor several hundred of years ago rather than several thousands. And you can see convergence in other places as well. Here is a place where the green line and the purple line converge. Um, and this is due to back mutations and parallel mutations. Because we're only looking at, uh, well, a back mutation would be, for example, here, where it used to be a value of 14 here, and it went back to a previous value of 13. Another example of a back mutation would be here, where it was a value of 6, then 5, and now it's gone back to 6. Um, and there's another back mutation, because that back mutation here is the same as a previous value. And then we even have a back mutation up here, where the value of 8 goes back to the previous value it was back there. So these are back mutations. Parallel mutations would be these blue ones here. Oh, and I'll, um, so here, for example, it, um, is a parallel mutation. In the purple line, it goes from 8 to 7 at this point in time. In the green line, it goes from 8 to 7 at this point in time. So it's a parallel mutation that occurs at different time points, but it's still a parallel mutation. And here's another one here, a value from 8 up to, to 9, and another one here, a value of 8 up to 9. Uh, the same mutation happening in parallel in different lines of descent. So a visualization of convergence would be, and remember we're just using a single marker in this last example, but if you multiply that by 37, you know, what are the chances that those back mutations and parallel mutations are going to converge eventually? Here's one line of descent. The other line of descent initially diverges, but some of the branches come back and converge. And it looks like they're close matches with a common ancestor within the last 100, 200, 300 years, but in actual fact, the common ancestor is a long time ago, several thousand years ago. So two distantly related individuals appear much more closely related than they actually are, and it's due to these back mutations and parallel mutations which are essentially hidden from us in the present day. Because we cannot see, all we have is what our project members today have in their SDR values. We cannot see what the progress, what the evolution of those present day markers was to get to the present day. Um, the genetic distance says it is, for example, 4 out of 37, um, uh, but in fact the connection is a lot further back in time than it is, uh, apparently. Um, looking at Dave Vance actually simulated um, these back mutations and parallel mutations, and within the surname era, which would be the time of your surname project, you can expect parallel mutations to outnumber back mutations by a factor of about 20 to 1, of 40 to 1. So there's many, many, many more time uh, parallel mutations than there would be back mutations. Um, here's an example of convergence in my Malloy group 4, and this is just copied from um, uh, the Family Tree DNA Haplotree. I've been also able to extract the dates for these various uh, branching points from Y full. And this particular person is M22. He lies on a branch below M222, which is notorious for convergence. Um, there are three M222 groups in the Malloy project. 
One of them uh, is just hasn't done any further downstream testing um, and is stuck up at the F222 level. Another one, group six, has tested a little bit further downstream, DF105, and then the Malloys are positive for ZS8379. But one of the members within that particular group, group four, has tested negative for it. So here we have a situation where you have convergence with a same surname. Very unusual, but it does happen. And you also see convergence at 111 markers and at 67 markers. So it's something that we need to be aware of and something that we need to action. So how do we actually um, do that? How do we recognize convergence? There's a higher risk of convergence at lower levels of testing, like 12 markers or 25 markers, and a much less risk of convergence the higher you go 37, 67, 111. And by convergence, I mean within that matching threshold. I don't mean an exact match, I mean a match below 4 out of 37, 7 out of 67, 10 out of 111. Those matching thresholds. So a convergent match could be 0, zero out of 37, which I think is very rare, it's very rare to get an exact match. Um, but 4 out of 37, 3 out of 37 is usually what you see when you come across a convergent match. Um, there's lots of matches at 37 uh, or 67 or 111 markers. If you find a project member with a thousand matches at 37 markers, you can bet your bottom dollar that there is evidence of convergence there. There is going to be convergence and the majority of them, up to 90% of them, will be false positive matches. Matches that occur just by chance. Nobody gets a thousand matches and they all turn out to be within the same survey project. The other big clue is that you'll have many, many different surnames among the list of matches rather than a predominant one. And there are certain haplogroups groups where convergence is well recognized. M222 is one of them, L226 is another, and Bob Casey is there. Wave your hand, Bob. Bob is the admin of the L226 project, and he's, he, he, you see 90% uh, chance matches from time to time, Bob, don't you? Yep. Um, and then CTS4466 is another uh, haplogroup that is prone to these chance matches due to convergence. So it's more of a problem with dissimilar surnames and less of a problem with the same surname. You have the same surname and it looks like you know, genetic distance is like 2 out of 37. The likelihood that that is convergence is, is a lot less than if you have, say, a McDonald and a Farrell and the genetic distance is 2 out of 37 then you're left with a decision. Is this a possible non-paternity event? In which case, which came first, the McDonald's chicken or the Farrell's egg? Um, is it a pre-surname match and it's just you're matching somebody who had an extreme lack of divergence and they are just before the origin of surnames? I think that happens very, very rarely. Um, I think convergence is a much more common um, probability. And I would say if you do have um, these dissimilar surname matches, especially if you have a thousand um, uh, matches for an individual, 90% of them will be due to convergence, 10% might be NPEs, and I don't, I really don't believe very strongly, and I stand to be corrected, that pre-surname matches are that frequent. How to distinguish a genuine match from uh, chance matches due to convergence? You could upgrade to 67 or 111 markers, you could do downstream SNP testing, but a lot of your project members don't want to do it because it is expensive. Or you could use the matches terminal SNP analysis. And I'm going to show you how you do that. And that's just a way of predicting what the big Y result is going to be without actually spending $500 on the big Y. And also, you can, because of this MTSA procedure, it is now possible to quantify the possible degree of convergence uh, among a, a particular project member's matches. So I have talked about these markers of potential relatedness before. That's the YouTube video that goes on for a mere one hour and 31 minutes. So if you're really, really interested in my early thoughts on markers of potential relatedness, you can certainly watch that video. Again, it's up on um, DNA and Family Tree Research YouTube channel. But I'm going to just select the most relevant markers of potential relatedness for this talk. 
And here is my criteria for grouping using these markers of potential relatedness. It's the allocation of a particular member to a specific genetic family based on the presence of some or all of the following criteria, which can be considered markers of potential relatedness. And the more markers that are present, the more likely that there is a real relationship between those members in that genetic group, say within the last 700 to 1,000 years or so, within the surname era. And these criteria consist of both traditional genealogical indicators as well as genetic indicators. And here are the markers of potential relatedness. The members have the same surname. Well, that's kind of obvious. I mean, that's why we're all doing surname studies. You know, I'm at least, you're at least, and hey, we might be related. It stands to reason. They have the same surname. It's a marker of potential relatedness. It doesn't mean we are, but it creates that potential. The genetic distance between two members indicates a close or very close relationship, and that's using the family tree DNA matching criteria 4 out of 37, 7 out of 67, 10 out of 111. The TIP24 score is greater than 80%. That's discussed in the previous video. I'm not going to talk about it here. Genetic distance demarcation is another one. But here we're going to talk about rare marker values, the unique STR pattern, and also SNP testing and SNP predictions using the matches terminal SNP analysis. And then there's the same surname variant, same MDKA location. They come from the same place. And then having the same MDKA, they have the same ancestor. Well, that's a, a marker of potential relatedness if you act with the same ancestor as well. Um, we've talked about genetic distance as well. I'm not going to spend too much time on, on it. Those are the uh, thresholds. Uh, what I do now in my projects, and you can do this if you want, is I use genetic distance as my first guide. Then I look at the SNP data. If SNP data is not there, I try to predict what the big Y results are going to be using this matches terminal SNP analysis. And then I use rare marker values and unique STR patterns to try and group people appropriately. So um, genetic distance, you know, if you click on your admin pages, there's the genetic distance there. And then that takes you to the, you can set the marker level you click on the little arrow and then it brings you up um, the genetic distance. You always compare new project members to the modal haplotype, the project member that is closest to the modal haplotype in your particular genetic group. And are you use Terry Barton's or Chase Ashley's tool and have it done automatically <coughs> for you? And this is the grouping in the Farrell project, just to go through it very quickly. I found that after grouping them solely on the basis of genetic distance, then I had the same surname variant in GF1A, which was Farley, 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 and GF2A, uh, which was Feral, Feral, Feral. And I also found that one of the groups, that's uh, group genetic family three, had not only the same um, um, uh, ancestral location, which I used to call boat tort, but I learned this morning as bodato, boat, boto, barata. Thank you. Yes. Well, some people come over to London and say Leicester Square. So, um, so they're from the same location, and it's the same person as Gabriel Farrell was the, the, the common ancestor. And this is what happens. You, you group people on the basis of one marker of potential relatedness, and then you find out that they're also consistent on other markers of potential relatedness. So as a result of that, we had the same surname, same genetic to, uh, 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 certain variants, same MDK location, same MDKA, uh, so it actually ticks a lot of those markers potential relatedness, that particular exercise. Downstream SNP testing establishes the terminal SNP. Now, the terminal SNP is such a misnomer. You know, it sounds like a, a bad medical diagnosis. I'm sorry, sir, you have a terminal SNP. Um, it's, and it's, it's a total misnomer because there's no such thing as a terminal SNP because you have three months later a new terminal SNP, and then three months later it's a new terminal SNP. There's nothing terminal about it. It's just the most downstream SNP that they've currently been able to identify for your DNA. But, you know, a little bit more uh, downstream SNP testing and you get the next most downstream SNP. So I tend to use that expression, the current most downstream SNP, rather than terminal SNP. Um, it helps confirm the correct placement of an individual in a specific genetic cluster. 
and also on a particular branch of the tree of mankind. And why do you do it? Because it helps place individuals more downstream on the haplo tree uh, to assist with difficulties in grouping. If you're not sure where they should go, the downstream snip can help you. It helps identify the possibility of convergence, chance matches due to convergence. Um, it gives you information on deep ancestry and also possible geographical origins for the people in that particular genetic cluster. And it helps identify branches within a genetic family and helps build mutation history trees like we saw yesterday. Um, and this is an example of uh, the, the, the big Y tree, haplotree, tree, the big tree haplotree. tree. Um, there, I use various ones. Family tree DNA is haplotree tree is the most comprehensive for, for, for the coverage of SNPs. It's experimental, which is, suits me absolutely fine. But because it is, compared to the, the ISOC haplotree, tree, which is definitive, you know, um, it means that on the ISOC tree, you get the definitive placement of the SNPs on this particular part of the tree. With family tree DNA, sometimes they will move the SNPs around onto different branches once a little bit more data comes in. So it is experimental, but that's absolutely fine for my purposes. The y full haplotree tree actually has uh, dating points for the branches. So it actually dates the branches of the tree. And Alex Williamson's big tree, the Y tree, which only focuses on haplogroup R, um, has surnames at the end of every branch, like you see here. And also ancestral birth locations at the end of every branch. So ideally, what I would like to see is a haplotree that combines all of that. An experimental haplotree, which is comprehensive, which identifies definitive branches by making them bold or some sort of a, a, a way of identifying them. There's a date at every branching point on the tree, and it includes surnames and ancestral birth locations at the end of every single branch. So that is my, that's on my wish list. We'll, I predict we will have it in five years. That gets me off the hook. Um, oh, and just as a matter of interest, here are my Gleasons over here. These are all the Gleasons of lineage two. Here are the traces. You can see how far they are related to, how far away from the Gleasons they actually are, but using genetic distance, they are lumped right in the middle of Gleason lineage two. So, uh, and we can date the uh, common ancestor between the Traces and the Gleasons as being about 2,000 years before present. So, um, SNP tests are expensive. Uh, a single SNP test, not so much. Um, SNP packs, 119, very good value. The big Y test, 575, $395 in the sale. But project members do not want to spend that amount of money buying a big Y test. So. In place of actually buying the test, what you can do is predict what the test results will be. And this is how you do it. First of all, you open the individual's matches list. So you have a new project member who comes along, you want to assess him, you open his matches list. Um, and you look at each level, 111, 67, 37, down to 25 marker level, I don't go down to 12. And you sort the list by haplogroup. I'm going to show you how to do this in the next slide. And you note down the terminal snips of all of his matches. Say he has uh, 30, say he has 60 matches at the 25 marker level, you will note down the terminal snip of each of those 60 matches. Those that have done downstream snip testing. Ignore all those M269s, ignore all the upstream um, uh, snips, and just make a note of those snips that are downstream. And then you plot these SNPs on the haplotree. And what you're looking for is a straight line, that all of them line up on a single branch of the haplotree. Do they fall on the same branch, or do they fall on different branches? Because if they fall on different branches, then convergence is probably present. How extensive is that convergence is the next question. And is it occurring just really quite far downstream and you don't need to worry about it too much? Or is it actually happening quite far upstream, which is going to be more of a problem? But let's look at a few um, uh, examples. First of all, this is the results page for a particular individual, and he has got, at 25 marker level, 183 matches. So the first thing you do 
is click on the YDNA haplogroup, group, and that orders them alphabetically. And I've already done it, and that's why you see the terminal snips up here beginning with B, then C, then D, and so on. And look, there's a whole load of L1335s down here. Um, and what you then do is see where this, these ones uh, sit on the haplotree. tree. And there's L1335, and if I look at all of the other ones, I find that they are below L1335. Now, this particular project member, he will be told, oh, you need to do the M269 and then 343 snip pack, which is a very, very far upstream snip pack. But I can predict that he's from all of the, all of the most downstream, the terminal snips, let's call the terminal snips of his matches, they're all pointing to below L1335. So I can say, no, forget about the upstream snip pack. You need to test with the L1335 snip pack. Now I say I'm 99% confident that you will test positive for this SNP and one of the SNPs below this one. But I'm allowing myself a 1% wiggle room. And if you want to spend your money, then it's at your own risk. But I'm saying I'm 99% confident. If you wanted to, you could test for the single SNP L1335 beforehand and then move on to the SNP pack. But the majority of people actually just go straight for the SNP pack and I haven't been wrong yet. I need some wood to touch. <laughs> um, uh, and this is, this is what the output is of the matches terminal SNP analysis. Um, now, I don't do this for everybody, but I just kind of wanted to demonstrate it on the, on the tree itself. So in, in, in one particular case, then, we found uh, with one project member, he had quite a few people testing for SA44. And then there was another, one, another of his matches tested uh, the terminal SNP S856, and then another match tested for this terminal SNP here, and then another uh, a couple of his matches tested for this SNP here, and then finally another uh, few tested for this terminal SNP here. This is relatively uncommon, but it shows a straight line with no other downstream branches being reported. So in this situation, I predicted he would be positive if he did the big Y test. He would be positive for SNP FGC20561, and he was. Now, it doesn't always work out like that, because sometimes what you see is convergence with, in the downstream branches. So upstream, L226, there's lots of people testing positive there, and then another a few of his matches tested positive for this branch down here. But then in the, in the last uh, branch, you actually see that some people are on this one, and some people are on this one over here. So this is where the convergence is happening, but it's very, very far downstream. It's not quite within that surname group, but it is quite downstream. And what we can predict is that he's going to test positive, if he did the big Y, for either this group here or this group here, in all likelihood. The most important message, though, is he's still going to test positive for L226, the subclade up here. And we can say, do the L226 SNP pack, and you'll either end up here or you'll end up here, but still the L226 SNP pack is the right one for you. With 99% probability, there's a 1% chance I might be wrong, so um, I leave it up to you whether you want to risk spending your money on a test that may be incorrect, but I'm 99% positive that that is what the situation is going to be. It will be positive for L226 and a downstream branch. Here's an example from uh, M222. And this is really quite far upstream. The, he, this is very, these, his matches terminal SNPs were all over the place. They were still below M222, but I could never, I, I predicted that he would be somewhere around here because this is the most frequent one. In fact, he was on a branch where he didn't actually share, um, have matches who had actually that, that terminal SNP. So you, you, this is a convergence with relatively upstream connections, but still below M222. Terry. The trouble, have I looked at these without the 25 marker? I have, but the trouble with, um, uh, if you go up to 37, you have far less matches and there's far less people have actually tested a terminal SNP. 
So I act, I'm actually finding that the 25 marker level is the better one to do. Um, so that's the Matches Terminal SNP analysis. It is surprisingly predictive in many, many cases. It doesn't work in all cases. Sometimes they're on, they're on a variety of different branches. They're or, they're RU106 or L21, P312, IP57. You know, so there might even be in different half of groups. And in that kind of situation, there's, you can't do anything with that data. So this is not an answer to everybody's situation. But I'd say it works in over 50% of cases. So it's very, very well worthwhile trying to look and predict where somebody sits. Now, it will direct you to what subplate SNP pack you can suggest to them that they will test positive for with 99% probability, but it won't necessarily tell you whether something is a convergent match or a non-convergent match. So for example, in the, if, if the traces, in the example of the traces, um, I, not, I can't remember what the MTSA, uh, I think it, it would have predicted, yes, the, the, it would have separated them out. But that's because that particular part of the tree is actually quite well SNP tested. And you're relying on the SNP testing all of the database to actually make this type of prediction. It frequently identifies the most likely terminal SNP. It can allow more focused confirmatory SNP testing via a single a SNP or the SNP pack. And it does allow estimation of the amount of chance matches due to convergence in a project member's match list. So for example, and I'll just flick through this, the important thing here is the, uh, this one here. This particular chap had 33 matches uh, uh, who had SNP tested, and seven of these 33 of his matches uh, were on different branches of the haplotree. tree. So if we extrapolate from the 33 of his 100 matches, whatever they were, who had done downstream SNP testing, extrapolate from that to the whole group, we can say that our estimate for the amount of chance matches due to convergence in this person's match list is about 21%. So as more people SNP test, we will be able to do this quantification procedure where we will be able to look at an individual's matches and we'll be able to say to them, I estimate based on those of your matches who have done SNP testing, that the number of chance matches in your list of matches is about 21%. And if you get out to M222 and L226, that figure may go up as high as 90%. Um, it's also very important to tell your project members to join the relevant haplogroup and geographic projects, because the administrators there can be very, very useful in helping you predict what SNP that project member would test for if they did the big Y. But also they're very useful at identifying these unique STO patterns from a much larger data set that you will have access to. So always get your project members to uh, join the appropriate half group of geographic projects. You tell them to and they don't do it. How do you get around that? As admins, you should not add them yourself because you don't have permission to do so. So you write them an email saying, you should join these projects, but I'm happy to do it for you if you'd prefer me to do so. Just drop me an email and say if you're happy for me to join you to the appropriate happy group projects. And the vast majority of times they write back to me and say, yes, please go ahead, do whatever you like. So we've looked at SNP testing and we've looked at SNP predictions. The last two are rare marker values and unique uh, STO pattern. Now, rare marker values, um, for, for this, we look at Leo Little's spreadsheet. And God bless him, he passed away, I think, in about 2005, but his legacy certainly uh, lives on. And these um, spreadsheets help identify the frequency of values for each marker. This is DIS 393, the first one. Uh, this is 390, the second one in the FTDNA sequence. This is the uh, marker nine, DIS 19. And he looks at the uh, incidence in these six major haplogroups, or seven major haplogroups. And uh, there are the, uh, frequent, the values there and the frequency of each of them. And from this, it's able to identify rare marker values. So for example, in, uh, for DYS390 in R1B, 
Um, it's uh, a value of 21 is extremely rare, zero uh, percent here. Um, only one percent of them are 22. 22 percent are 23. 60 percent are 24, and so on. So it's a very good way of recognizing rare marker values. And um, this is uh, an example from Kelly Wheaton's uh, Wheaton DNA uh, project, and she's got a, a very famous example of rare marker values. In the, she's got a Wheaton group B and a Wheaton group C. There's group B there, there's group C down there. In group B, they have a value of 14 for 393, which occurs in only 5% of the population. And they have a value of 16 for, for a marker 19, which occurs in 1% of the population. And they have a marker, a value of uh, 12 uh, for, for marker 385A, which occurs in 8% of the population. That combination is actually a unique STOR pattern, but that combination would occur by chance in approximately 1 in 62,000 people, on the basis of which she only needs the first 12 markers to group people into Wheaton group B. Because of these rare marker values, because of this unique STOR signature. Um, and speaking of unique STOR signatures, uh, this is why I like worldfamilies.net, is because you can see them immediately. This is group one, Gleason group one. You can see the unique pattern here, very different from the pattern you're seeing in group two, in lineage two, and very different from the pattern you're seeing in lineage three. So these are unique STOR patterns for each of the Gleason lineages. And then in the on groups, you can see that there's no pattern whatsoever. So um, these uh, are very, very useful when you come to trying to look at subgroups and making sure that people are grouped appropriately. And this is a, a chart that I showed yesterday. Here you can see a unique pattern, 17, 14, 17, 17, 14, 17, with these three people here. And this one here, you've got 10, 9, 9, and 17 which confers a unique STOR pattern on that particular group. So looking at this USP, this unique STOR pattern, can sometimes tell you whether um, a potential uh, match or a potential new member belongs in a group or is a, a chance match by convergence or doesn't belong there at all. So it does help you in this grouping uh, process. And um, Robert Casey has done a lot of work on this. Uh, he's also uh, presented at Genetic Genealogy Ireland last year, and there is a wonderful uh, video that is freely available to access uh, where Robert talks about how he has used um, S unique STOR patterns in his work and has developed a, a probability algorithm for allocating people to certain branches on the mutation history tree and certain groups within projects. So those are the markers of potential relatedness. Uh, they help us group people together who have similar genetic signatures. Um, and I would use genetic distance first, then I would jump to the matches terminal SNP analysis, then I would try rare marker values and unique STOR patterns. There's a few other ones that um, are of less importance. And finally, SNP testing. Finally, SNP testing, because most people don't want to pay for it. But if you get somebody who says, oh yeah, I'll do SNP testing, then just go straight for that. They help detect outliers who aren't in the project, but should be. They help detect chance matches due to convergence who are in the project, but shouldn't be. So it's very, very useful for helping to detect those. But the decision whether or not to group a new project member into a specific genetic group or not, depends on the totality of the evidence and your own judgment based on your accumulating experience as an administrator. Which is why I really encourage you to take on one of the larger orphan projects from worldfamilies.net and learn the craft that way. It's a great way of learning your craft when you have a lot of data to actually deal with. So you've finished grouping your project members. Now what? And this is something we kind of forget. We group them so we can analyze them. And we are not gonna talk about this today, but um, 
The kind of questions you could ask is, how old is the group? Well, you'd, you could do that either by pedigrees, by looking at the tip tool, by looking at SNP dating, or looking at Dave Vance's SAP program that we went through yesterday. How old is the, or where is the group from? The essential piece of information that is frequently missing is the birth location of the MDKA. Project members do not put that in, and it is the single most important piece of information to help you clarify where that genetic group originated. Old world pedigrees are essential as well, so you need to go back to the old world and to test people who have been in that area for a long time. You can do a nearest neighbor analysis. Oh, who are we genetic? Who's, who's sitting on the tree beside us on the adjacent branch? Oh, it's the Carols. Well, where did they come from? And who's on the other branch? The McMahons. Okay, where did the McMahons come from? And you can look at surname distribution maps and see if that gives you some indication. Are they Scottish? Are they Irish? Are they English? But it's not as good as actually having the MDK birth location and old world pedigrees tested. Is there any evidence of a surname or DNA switch? In which case you've got a chicken or an egg situation, and you have to decide, is this the, the Farrell come first and the McDonald's come later, or was it the other way around? One way of trying to solve this is looking to see, well, which group appears oldest? Is the Farrell group oldest, or is the McDonald's group oldest? Um, presumably the oldest group was the originator, uh, which came first, and then the NPE would have come later and would have less descendants and less genetic diversity. Is there any evidence of chance matches? And that means uh, looking for signs of convergence and trying to weed it out, doing a matches terminal SNP analysis, SNP pack testing, and ultimately the big Y. There's no escaping the big Y for some people. And what is the branching structure within the group? This is where the mutation history tree comes in. It's a great way of visualizing all the data together, and the SAP program will automate that eventually. So that is really where we're headed. I've tried this approach with uh, the Malloy clan, and there's another useful video that you might find uh, uh, instructive to, to watch, and that's um, on my uh, YouTube channel, DNA and Family Tree Research, that was from August of last year, and I applied those analytic techniques to the Malloy clan, and it only remains for me to say thank you very much. <laughs>